Hello, 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 Bravo lovers, and welcome to another episode of Bravo Tea with Jared B. I hope everyone had a fantastic weekend, and I hope everyone is having a fantastic week thus far. This weekend, I spent some time with my besties, my very good friends, and my goddaughter in Blue Ridge, Georgia. Let me tell you something. Ten years ago, I would have never told you that I am a mountain person, but I think I am becoming a mountain person. There's something about going to a location that just brings you peace, that is quiet, that is safer than a metropolitan city. So I'm feeling relaxed. I'm feeling refreshed. I'm feeling happy to be here to give you this podcast episode. So on today's episode, of course, we have a recap of the Real Housewives of Atlanta. They are continuing their girls trip. Sheree would say healing trip, but I think it's a shady trip. In Portugal. Also, who suggests to go to Portugal in the wintertime? That's not the time to go to Portugal. It's June, July, August, early September. Who thought of that? Sheree or production or both? We also have episode... Episode... <laughs> Episode two of season 14 of The Real Housewives of New York City, where the ladies head to Aaron's house in the Hamptons, specifically Sag Harbor. Um, I did miss me some Bryn Whitfield in this episode. I think her presence was definitely missed. The energy was off, but it was still an okay episode. So let's get right into it. So we have The Real Housewives of Atlanta. This is season 15, episode 11, titled Makeups, Slip-Ups, and Cover-Ups. So this episode continues with Drew Sador leaving the table in tears, which follows with Sanya, Kenya, and Sheree going to check on her. Now, I believe that Sheree's genuinely trying to check on Drew, but Drew doesn't want to hear from Sheree at this point. I think what happens in this group is that the insults, the fun shade, the shady shade sometimes gets mixed in the same pot of soup, and it becomes difficult to differentiate from when one of the ladies is trying to have a real, honest, and authentic moment. So at this dinner, Drew was being authentic with telling Sheree she was hurt and disappointed with the jokes and the discussion about her lawsuit with that chef. And I think Sheree thought Drew was trying to make a moment for television. That's just what I think. Now, Candy thinks that Drew was putting on for the camera because when Drew walks out, Candy's like, and scene. Now, people might find this insensitive of Candy to say when Drew is clearly upset. However, in defense of Candy, sometimes when I have watched Drew as she has been on this show, especially in scenes with Drew and Ralph, it feels rehearsed, it feels inauthentic, and it feels self-produced. Now, Drew explains that it's not just about the lawsuit. It's what this personal chef has done in the interim. The, uh, I guess, leaking this, these things to the blogs and, you know, uh, reaching out to her family, contacting her family. So there's a lot more going on with this lawsuit than just $1,000 owed. And I think Kenya, Kenya Moore, Kenya Moore hair care, Kenya Moore hair care, Kenya Moore clocked it in her confessional. I, too, believe that these mo- these emotions, excuse me, have a lot to do with Ralph, because let's remember, Ralph is in Vegas doing God knows what while Drew is in Portugal. They are literally on opposite sides of the earth. And Drew explains that when she was away last year, the manager was hitting up Ralph to give him a massage. And my question is, what is Ralph doing this year while Drew's away? Maybe allegedly getting oiled up by the producer of Chocolate City in Las Vegas? So then Kenya comes up with an idea to possibly come together as a cast to help pay for the $1,000. Kenya asks Sheree, what's 1000 divided by 8? Now, I'm not a mathematician, so I did have to, you know, whip out my calculator and $1,000 divided by 8 is $125 per person. You're welcome, Kenya. But 
essentially I'm happy that Sheree and Drew can make amends in this moment. And then everyone gets back to the table and the ladies discuss Candy's absences from the group. They feel like Candy hasn't been showing up for them. Candy explains that the opportunities that are coming up for her group escape are hard to turn down because they might not get them again. And Candy is busy. Candy is very busy. She's married with a family. She has restaurants. She has her line of sex toys called Bedroom Candy. She's producing Broadway shows. She's acting. She's touring with her group Escape. And I believe at the time she was also uh, filming the reality show with Escape and SWV. I believe that was all happening at the same time. But my personal fear for Candy is that she's going to work herself into the ground because there is such a thing as working too much And maybe Candy needs to take a step back and be like, listen, all these opportunities are great, but there are things lacking in my personal life. Like Candy says, she never just takes time for herself. That's not good, Candy. You're going to work yourself into an early grave if you do not take a break, take a rest. So we get to the next day in Portugal and the ladies are gathered in the lobby to venture out for the day in Portugal. And Sheree breaks down the itinerary for the day. They're going to visit the market. They're going to choose their lunch items from the market, I guess. And then when they get to lunch, the chef is going to make what they have chosen into a meal, I guess. And then they have pottery class. Now, maybe it's just me. But pottery class? Who goes to Portugal to make pottery when you can do the same thing in Atlanta? This is the activity that I would probably opt out of, and I would probably use this moment to go back to the hotel and take a nap. But I do understand the fact that Sheree is trying to facilitate healing and bonding, which is probably why she chose pottery, but I just think that's a lame group activity to do in Portugal. So the ladies get on the bus and they're waiting for Kenya, who in the past has made it known how rude it is to be late. But after Kenya finally finds the door to exit the hotel, she slips and falls and gets rushed to the hospital. Now, I mean, this is Kenya's second time being rushed to the hospital this season. Any more falls, coughs, colds? touches of the flu, and Kinga Moore might snatch Vicky Gumbelson's crown as the emergency room queen, okay? Because, Lord have mercy. And if you don't know who Vicky Gumbelson is, shame on you. She is the OG of the OC, Orange County, Real Housewives of Orange County. And if you know, pretty much every (laughs) every cash trip someplace, Vicky ended up in the ER, urgent care, some medical facility. And it even happened on season two of the Real Housewives Ultimate Girls Trip when they were at Dorinda's. Vicky was sick, recovering from COVID. I think she ended up having a sinus infection. And the production medic had to take her to urgent care. So this is why I say if Kenya gets sick or get gets rushed to the hospital any more this season, she might just snatch Vicky's crown as the emergency room queen. Now... My issue after Kenya fell is the driver of the bus just stood there and literally watched Kenya on the ground in pain. And now Sheree is like, oh, this trip is not going as planned. Kenya fell and the weather is horrible. And speaking of horrible weather, why did Sheree and or production decide on going to Portugal in the fall or the winter? There are only a handful like literally a handful of places in Europe that still have nice weather during this time of the year. The time of the year to go to Portugal is like June, July, August, early September, when it's still warm outside. Not, you know, I guess, no, because wasn't a week or two ago, the ladies were talking about how their Thanksgiving was. So this is around Christmas time, maybe like New Year's. So yeah, December, January is certainly not the time to go to Portugal at all. They probably should have gone to the Caribbean or South or Central America, not Portugal. Now, the ladies get off the bus. They go back in the hotel. 
and cousin Courtney and Drew sit down in the hotel lobby and Courtney says with the a very serious like I don't think Courtney was being shady in this moment. I think Courtney was being very serious. Courtney's like the universe has a strange way of driving things sometimes if necessary. It's called karma. And <laughs> Drew's like, I don't know how I feel about this cousin Courtney, but cousin Courtney was like, we need to clear the negative energy out. And you know what? Kenya cleared. Maybe not the way Kenya wanted to clear, but Kenya got cleared. And now she ends up spending seven and a half hours in the hospital. Is cousin Courtney a witch? <laughs> what? Listen, Cousin Courtney is like, what goes around comes around. What goes up must come down. If you know Alicia Keys, you know the song I was just singing horribly. Um, <laughs> so we move on to lunch in Portugal. And the ladies are at lunch, minus, of course, Kenya and Candy, because Kenya is in the ER. And for some reason, the ladies think that Kenya should ask for the VIP treatment. Um, but I think the only VIP you get in the hospital, if it's life threatening or if a woman is in labor or like the president got shot, like I think that's the only VIP treatment you get in a hospital. But the ladies start talking. They ask Marlo about Scotley and Sheree throws Kenya right under the bus while she's in the ER by telling Marlo that Kenya said her relationship is not real, that it's a it's a Tinder date, which, I mean, there are people that have met on Tinder that end up in relationships. So I, I didn't really get the comparing it to a Tinder date because, like, you know, a lot of people on Tinder, they use that app to hook up, but people also use that app to find the love of their life. So, you know, that shade from Kenya didn't really land um, and Marlo probably should have just ignored it, but we know Marlo's not going to ignore anything that comes from Kenya Moore. Now, Monietta, on the other hand, I think that she has full-time housewife potential, but I do understand that she is loyal to the soil when it comes to her friendships with Kenya and Kenya. But I do need Monietta to branch out and create fin friendships, excuse me, with everyone or almost everyone, because just being friends with Candy and Kenya won't get you far in this group, especially when Ken Kenya and Candy are not there. Then Sheree, the one that threw this healing trip, threw Candy under the bus and told Drew that when she got up from the table, Candy said, and seen. Like, isn't it crazy how Sheree is hosting a healing trip for the group all while stirring the pot and throwing Candy and Kenya under the bus while they are not there? Like, Kenya's one, uh, not Kenya, Sheree is one of those, like, confessional gangsters that she gives all her shade and insults in the confessional, but rarely says it to someone's face. And I'm not saying Sheree has never, you know, gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone with her opinion, but, you know, it feels like this season, uh, Sheree is saving all her shade for the confessionals. And um, I feel like, would Sheree say the, would Sheree throw Candy and Kenya under the bus if they were at that lunch? Do you guys think, <laughs> do you guys think Sheree would have, you know, taken it there if Kenya and Candy were in the room <laughs> at the lunch? At the table. But I find it interesting also that the topic of conversation at the table is revolving around two people who are not at the table. And then we find out, of course, I mentioned this earlier, seven and a half hours in the hospital. Kenya is finally released from the hospital. So then the ladies go to a pottery class and it's nighttime and Portugal and, you know, again, with the pottery class, why aren't they out at a bar, you know, turning up? Why pottery? Why pottery? And I don't have anything against pottery for all those pottery makers, the potteryist <laughs> out there. No shade to your pottery making, but I just feel like pottery class is not a place for, you know, an international trip. That's just my opinion. 
So then we get to girls' night, and Sheree throws a girls' night in her hotel room because it's Candy's last night in Portugal with them. And then Drew brings to Candy's attention that Drew was told that Candy felt like Drew was acting at that moment she was crying at dinner. But what I love about Candy Moneybags Burris is that she will own up to the things that she says. Meanwhile, you know, some of the other ladies save their honesty and shade for the confessionals, which is weak, in my opinion. I'm personally the type of person that will say it to your face before I say it behind your back, which has gotten me into trouble over the years, but I'd rather be known for my honesty than be known for being fake and two-faced. So let me get in trouble. Then Sanya opens up about her family dynamics. Um, Listen, if I was a producer of the show, I would have set up a family therapy scene with Sanya's family so that they can air out these grievances grievances. Um, You know, I feel like if we're going to be subjected to Sanya's family dynamics this whole season, let us watch the drama play out because at this point I'm I'm uninterested in her family situation completely, like checked out. I almost only want to hear about her family situation when Sanya's sister is in the room because I find Sanya's sister very entertaining with her reactions and calling out her sister and being like, you know, you're getting on my nerves and we are moving out. Trust and believe. Don't worry. We're leaving. You're making me sick. My question is, who's the older sister in this? Because it feels like Sanya's sister is the older sister and Sanya is the younger sister. And I would find it quite interesting with these dynamics that we have seen play out this season thus far, if Sanya is the eldest sister and her little sister is the little sister or her sister is the little sister. Sorry about that. But during this uh, girls' night in Sheree's bedroom, she by Sheree comes up and (laughs) Sheree basically pressures them to purchase some merch from her website, and at this point, I think that these are the only people I know that have bought any She by Sheree products. If you are a Real Housewives of Atlanta fan, if you have been watching the show, you know, if you are listening, let me know if you have purchased any She by Sheree. Slide in my DMs. Let me know on Instagram, Twitter. Let me know. Or on threads. But, like, who has actually bought she by Sheree. Because, like, you know, my mom watches the show. Shout out to mom. Um, and I asked her, you know, would you buy any She by Sheree? And she was like, well, I went on the website. And she was like, you know, some of her stuff is a little expensive. Um, and listen, I just think that Sheree is not at the caliber in, you know, the universe and entertainment to be charging, you know, $200, $300 for a sweatsuit. When, you know, people are paying that for like Beyonce's Ivy Park. And I just don't think Ivy Park and She by Sheree are on the same level, if you know what I mean. But then production wraps at 1147 p.m. And the ladies are still hanging out in Sheree's room. And the bolo night comes up from three seasons ago when the ladies went to Charleston, South Carolina, and threw Cynthia Bailey a bachelorette party because she was getting married to Mike Hill, uh, who she is now divorced from. And things got a little wild, you know, if you remember, when the cameras went down. And Drew Sador was accused of making out with LaToya, who was a friend of at the time. Drew denies making out with LaToya. Drew says that Candy told LaToya to say that she made out with Drew. Drew outright, even in her confessional, with a, when a producer asks her, Drew denies ever kissing a woman. But the thing is, you know, Marlo said she kissed someone. I think, well, LaToya said they kissed. Kenya said they kiss. You know, right now this is three against one, and I'm inclined to believe the three people who have confirmed seeing the same thing. I'm just saying. But based on the preview of what's left of the season, the streets are talking, and allegedly Drew Sador has or has had a situation with a woman named Ty, so we shall see what happens with that. 
Um, it's so sad that it took like this long in this season to finally get to something like worth watching. You know, like the the rest of the season, which I, I feel like there's only like because usually when a cash trip happens, that's international. Usually we are now on the back half of the season. So I believe there's probably three, four, maybe five episodes left of the actual season because Andy Cohen, I think, tweeted last week asking for questions from viewers because they're about to film the reunion for the Real Housewives of Atlanta. So this season's about to wrap up, which is surprising because I feel like Atlanta usually has long seasons, you know, 20, 21, 22 episodes. So, I mean, I don't blame them for making the season short because not much has really happened. Like, in, in all honesty, to me, the season has felt a bit disjointed. Um, and I think the main issue is that there is a lack of authentic friendship within this group of women. And I think that I don't know what needs to be done. I still believe I still stand by the fact that I don't believe that this show needs to be rebooted, gutted with a brand new cast. I just think that they need to shift the cast around a little bit. And I've mentioned this, you know, bring back Candy. Bring back Marlo, Sheree, Kenya. Bring Portia back. Please bring Portia back. I'm willing to give Drew another t- another chance. Excuse me. Uh, Sanya can hit the road, Jack. And don't come back no more, no more, no more. I would love to see Shamia as a friend of or a potential full-time housewife. I would like to see Bonietta as a potential full-time housewife. And you know what? I didn't mind Cousin Courtney this season. I think that she has great housewife or friend of potential. So let's bring Cousin Courtney back as a friend of for another season. That's how I feel about so far with the Real Housewives of Atlanta. And when we return, (laughs) I am going to discuss this week's episode of the Real Housewives of Nueva York. So now we have The Real Housewives of New York City. This is season 14, episode 2, titled Oh Christmas Tree. So Uber arrives to pick up Cy in Brooklyn because the ladies are heading to the Hamptons to stay with Erin at her home in Sag Harbor. The ladies are only staying in the Hamptons for three days and... Sai has packed for basically two weeks. Sai packed <laughs> eight pieces of luggage... But I have to say, I can relate to Sai at this moment because I also tend to overpack for things. I'm not a fashion influencer like she is, but I too, I overpack for things. When I went to Cashers, North Carolina for 4th of July, I only was there for like four or five days, but I packed a full carry-on suitcase. I brought uh, four pairs of sunglasses and five pairs of shoes, and I even brought my steamer with me. And that's because I like to be prepared for anything. I pack for weather changes, mood, personality changes, and activities. And, you know, sometimes you change your mind. Sometimes you put things on and it's like, oh, I don't like the fit for this. Oh, this might get dirty. You know, things happen. So I would rather bring options than feel like I don't have anything to wear, if that makes sense. But I do think that Sai should have consolidated her clothes more strategically since she's not the only one traveling in this car to the Hamptons. Again, it's Sai, Uba, and then Jessel. So Erin is getting ready for the ladies' arrival, and she has a caviar caterer come over, has monogram pajamas for all the ladies, and Uba calls Erin to see if she will have food. Aaron says that she has a caviar spread, and Sai is like, caviar? <laughs> These girls are so high maintenance. So high maintenance. Sai and Uber are not feeling the caviar spread. Now we have... 
<laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> like, you know, th- some of these ladies turn me off a little bit with, you know, being a little too high maintenance, you know, size bringing enough clothes for a month. She also brought her two ply toilet paper because she didn't think Aaron would have it. And now they have a problem with the caviar spread. And I like caviar. I actually love caviar. I think the issue is, you know, this drive from New York City to the Hamptons is like three, four hours depending on traffic, which means that for three or four hours, they did not eat and then got to Aaron's, had caviar, and then three hours later, we're going to go out for dinner. So I, I kind of understand the disappointment with just arriving to Aaron's house. If you hear scratching, I'm scratching my beard. I don't know if this picks up in the sound, but like, you know, I would understand the ladies being a little bit frustrated and hangry arriving to errands for just caviar after you've just spent three, four hours in a car. So I can get that frustration and disappointment on behalf of Uba and Sai. But <laughs> then the swaggy ass Jenna Lyons arrives to Aaron's place in a blue vintage Mercedes. And honestly, at this point, I expect nothing less from Jenna Lyons. She's just effortlessly cool. And then we find out in the car with Jessel, Uba, inside that Jessel has not had sex with her husband since her kids were born. Um, and I believe her kids are like one years old, one year old, one year old. I believe she has a set of twins that are both one because obviously they would have been born on the same day. So that would make them both one. But Jessel reveals that she hasn't felt comfortable in her body since her C-section, but she does confirm that she is providing blowjobs to her husband. So I guess good for her husband. But honestly, I don't know if that's enough because if you are not having sex with your husband, then someone else will, Jessel. And based on some of the previews we saw coming up this season, uh, Jessel's husband is like, I I need to go to Vietnam because I need some time to myself. Now, you know, to go all the way to Vietnam for time for yourself when you can maybe go to the Hamptons, go to upstate New York, go to the Berkshires, maybe stay in a hotel and get like a massage in New York City. But to go all the way to Vietnam for some alone time? uh Uh-huh. Hell to the na, to the na, na, na. Like I said, if you are not having sex with your husband, especially after a year, someone else will. And someone else might be already. Now, based on what I've seen on Twitter, people are not entirely sure how they feel about Sai. But I laughed at the funny shade she threw when they finally arrived to Aaron and found out they're getting caviar and a potato chip. And she was like, girl, are we doing high low? Did she go to the bodega and get some Pringles for the caviar? (laughs) For those who don't know what a bodega is, a bodega is a small convenience store that sells, you know, chips, candy, coffee, soda, lottery tickets, over-the-counter stuff, along with, like, household items like laundry detergent, trash trash bags. It's like a mini grocery store. And some bodegas have a deli counter, some sell beer and wine, and many are open 24-7. Now, I have to say, as a native New Yorker, as someone who goes to New York to visit often, but not as often as I would like, one of the first places I go when I get to New York City, other than White Castle, is I go to a bodega. And I might get an Italian sandwich with a bag of baked Lay's, and not a whole bag of baked Lay's, like a small bag, a snack size. And I'll get a Snapple, or I'll get some Halal, You know, some chicken over rice with the white sauce and a little bit of hot sauce on top of the white sauce. Mix it up. Delicious. I promise you. So the ladies are sitting down, uh, maybe in Aaron's living room. Uh, You know, I feel like there's a couple of living rooms in that 65 square foot, 6,500, excuse me, not 65 square foot, 6,500 square foot house in Sag Harbor. But Jenna opens up about her mother. Uh, Jenna reveals that her mother was sick for several months and then things progress further with her health. I don't know if further in a good way or further in a bad way. Uh, But Jenna also shares that her mom has Asperger's and struggled with making connections 
connections and that her mother was cold and emotionless, which is why Jenna sometimes can come off as cold herself. But I must say, Jenna Lyons might not be the most dramatic or, you know, the funniest, the comic relief of the cast or the pot star, but Jenna has shared a lot about her life in the span of two episodes. So she makes up in her personal story for what she lacks in other departments. Plus, Jenna has swag for days. She's cool. She drives a vintage Mercedes and has a cool apartment in Soho that I would buy in a heartbeat if I had millions of dollars. So I'm liking Jenna Lyons, dare I say, loving Jenna Lyons. But Uba left... <laughs> Aaron's house to get some food because caviar was not enough. And listen, I would have probably had more than caviar for the girls who just traveled three or four hours from New York City to the Hamptons. But Uba goes to provisions and finds out it's closed. Now, I mean, I'm wondering, like, did Uba go by Burger King or like White Castle Or did she go by, you know, McDonald's? Or she could have stopped by the grocery store King Cullen. I know they have King Cullens on Long Island, especially in the Hamptons. So, like, Uba could have stopped by King Cullen, got herself some deli meat, some cheese, some good bread, and made herself a sandwich. She could have bought some snacks and brought them back for the house. You know, just don't go to provisions and then give up because they're closed, Uba. You know, there are options in the Hamptons. You're not on a desert island. But I digress. So we get to dinner at Topping Rose. If you don't recognize Topping Rose for all those OG Real Housewives of New York fans, you know, Topping Rose has been mentioned many times in the past. I believe one season the ladies were in the Hamptons. And um, Carol Radzewell and Tinsley Mortimer were staying at some hotel within walking distance of Topping Rose, which I believe is in Bridgehampton, possibly, maybe. I don't know. I don't know my Hamptons. I'm from Long Island, which the the Hamptons are on Long Island. But I'm like... Where I grew up is like probably two, two and a half hours from the Hamptons, honestly. So then, oh, yes, sorry. (laughs) I skipped ahead on my notes. So before the ladies head out to dinner at Topping Rose, Jenna checks Jessel's outfit and lets her know that she is doing too much. She is wearing an Alexander Wang outfit that literally says Alexander Wang with a Balenciaga bag that says Balenciaga. Now, I agree with Jenna. Please no more conflicting labels, ladies. If you wear more than one designer in one outfit, then... The outfit should not show the designer's name because I I find it's a little tacky. And listen, Jenna was looking out for Jessel. Jessel just needed to, like, make an edit to her look. You know, listen, respect the swaggy Jenna Lyons who, you know, works in fashion. And Jenna's like, "Uh, Jessel should know better because she works in fashion, too. But listen... Even people in fashion make mistakes because I see people that work in fashion and I'm like, where are the fashions? Where are the fashions? So, of course, at dinner, Jenna's, uh, not Jenna, Jessel's sexless marriage comes up again, which ends up leading to Jenna opening up about her coming out and how the New York Post basically forced Jenna to come out the closet because they found out about her in a relationship with a woman and they contacted Jenna at J. Crew to confirm the story and Jenna just owned it and stepped into her truth. So shout out to Jenna Lyons. We're giving her a round of applause for being honest about her life. And then Uba walks into the kitchen of Topping Rose, asks to try some food and takes some coconut milk so she can use it to make her rice and peas. Listen, I love rice and peas, coconut rice and peas, coconut milk, unsweetened coconut milk is like very important. Very important. Sorry, I got a call from someone. (laughs) Coconut milk, unsweetened is very, very important if you're going to make coconut rice and peas. I make a mean, mean, I tell you, coconut rice and peas. So after dinner, the ladies get back 
to Aaron's house. And after dinner, they try on their lingerie gifted by Jenna Lyons. At first, Uba didn't like her lingerie, but I thought she looked hot. I thought Uba looked beautiful in her lingerie. Like, not all lingerie, like, you know, the lingerie doesn't have to be a, a muumuu, you know. But, like, it was a nice look, like, short. I don't know how to describe this look, this lingerie look. I don't wear lingerie. I don't buy lingerie. I don't know how to describe this lingerie. So I'm just moving on. But I think that Uber looked hot. That's all I'm saying. And then Jessel comes downstairs a little frustrated in her lingerie because she's not feeling it. Jessel feels like she looks like a Christmas tree. (laughs) And Jessel's complaining and saying that she hates it. Now, I have to say, the lingerie is not the most flattering on Jessel. It is ill-fitting and a horrible color and maybe more suited for Mrs. Claus after Santa does a, a, you know, a practice run delivering gifts before Christmas Day. But what Jessel should have done is politely accept the gift and then trash it when you get home. Many times it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And at this moment, I found Jessel to be a tad bit rude and bratty because Jenna didn't have to give you shit, Jessel. I almost called you Dressel. Jenna didn't have to give you anything, Jessel. So accept the gift, even though you might not like it, and just move on. And that was pretty much this episode of the Real Housewives of New York. This episode was okay. Like, the season premiere excited me. This episode was, you know, meh. It wasn't horrible, but it wasn't great. I think that this episode definitely needed some Bryn Whitfield energy, and I'm happy that she will be returning next week. You know, Bryn is under the weather, so she did not show up for the first day, first night in the Hamptons, but Bryn is returning, and I'm very excited about that. The energy should pick up on episode three, which is next Sunday. I always want to sincerely thank you guys for supporting the pod. Thank you for listening. Thank you for following. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for telling your friends, your family, your coworkers about Bravo T with Jared B. It truly means the world to me. If you missed it, I did interview Alex Propson from season four's Below Deck Sailing Yacht. That episode came out Friday. You can listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, iHeartRadio, or anywhere where you can listen to a podcast. You can also watch my interview with Alex on YouTube. Bravo Tea with Jared B does have a YouTube page. Don't forget to subscribe to that. We are working on transitioning to video, so hopefully that will be coming soon. Uh, that is all the Bravo Tea I have for you today. Watch out for that new podcast episode that comes out on Friday that will feature my uh, brain fart, feature my recap of this week's Welcome to Crappy Lake with Luann and Sonia and the Real Housewives of Orange County. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Bravo T with Jared B. On Twitter, Bravo T with JB. On threads, the same as my Instagram. And we are also on TikTok. I'm working on getting better at TikTok. Listen, I have a full time job. I can't be on Twitter, on TikTok, on Instagram all day at work. So, but I'm trying to get better. Forgive me. <laughs> but that's all the Bravo T I have for you today. I love you for listening. And until next time, have a good one.